Hi, this is Randall here in Texas. And I'm Matt, here in Michigan. Today, Randall and I are taking a flashback review to a natural disaster movie from 1996. We're checking out Twister. Now, it stars Helen Hunt, Bill Paxton, Carrie Elwes, Jamie Gertz, and Philip Seymour Hoffman. It is directed by Jan DeBont, who's also directed Speed 1 and 2, The Haunting, and Laura Croft Tomb Raider, The Cradle of Life. Now, if you like this review, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Also, be sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. In Twister, we follow a group of storm chasers in their attempt to deploy a revolutionary diagnostic package that will be able to see the inside of a tornado. Twister had about an 80 to 90 million dollar budget, but ended up grossing 495 million dollars at the box office. It is the second highest grossing film of 1996 behind Independence Day, which we have a review of. It came out to mixed critical and audience responses, but has become a little bit of a cultural phenomenon, even being the basis for a Universal Studio ride that closed sometime in 2015 or 18. There has been a potential reboot announced in June of 2020, so maybe we'll see what happens. And of course, it has another claim to fame. It is purportedly one of the first ever wide-released movies on DVD in the United States. Matt, taking a look back at this one, what did you think about Twister? So, Randall, this is one of my, like, go-to 90s, like, I don't know, disaster films or however you want to describe it. This is one of my go-to 90s movies. So me, I have quite a bit of nostalgia for this film, but I actually haven't watched it in a little bit of a while. I think it's still pretty enjoyable for me. I still enjoy watching it, though some things I shake my head at a little bit more now than I did watching it before, but I still enjoy it. I still have a good time watching this movie. How about you? Oh, no, Matt. Before we can go any further in my initial <laughs> thoughts, we have to take a little bit of a side tour to Cars and Movies. Cars and Movies! There are three cars of note in this that I want to pinpoint. There are two hero cars and one villain car. The two hero cars, a 1995 Dodge Ram 2500 that had just come off its hot remodel in 1994. Sales went up significantly after people saw what the Dodge Ram could do in Twister. The other hero car of note, a 1982 Jeep J10, also known as the Honcho Townside, unceremoniously flipped by a tornado early on in the film. Rest in peace. And by no coincidence, all the good guys driving Chrysler and Ford products, the bad guys driving a Chevy. A 1989 Chevy Suburban 2500 Dually, dressed in, of course, evil black. Just about made it through that one without laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, too, because I actually noticed that, too, like the, the lead car was a Chevy, but some of the bad guys, like backup cars, they were actually... Oh, nope, uh, those are all Chryslers. Those are all like Plymouths. Yeah, this was, yeah, yeah, they're all Chryslers. I noticed that. <laughs> I'm like, that's funny. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Only the bad guy that dies is driving a Chevy. <laughs> and the good guys all drive Chryslers and Fords. I'm sure there's no coincidence. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> Anyways, now, back to the review. It's coming! It's headed right for us! It's already here. Yes, Matt, I absolutely agree with you. I love Twister. It's it's a fun go-to movie. Uh, I'm not going to say like it's a guilty pleasure because honestly, I'm not guilty for liking this film. It, it just is a pretty fun film. I remember having this on VHS and watching it all the time. It was like, okay, well, let's watch Twister. Twister's fun to watch. And then, you know, when we were down in Universal, like back in 2003 or something like that, we went to the ride and the ride was fun. It was a like a good thing, like introduced by Bill Paxton and everything. It It's a bit of a weird phenomenon considering how poorly received it is, both critically by audiences and and critics. Yeah, I was surprised by that too, especially with how much money this movie actually made compared to its budget and everything too. And I don't know why, but... Me, generally, I think people had, or at least in my mind, I thought people had generally positive thoughts on this movie, you know, looking back on, like, 90s, like, disaster films and stuff. I have you know quite a few people that like this movie, so I was actually surprised to see 
you know, the audience score being as low. Sometimes you're like critics, like, yeah, you know, critics don't like things, but, you know, the audience, you know, really likes this. But, yeah, I was surprised to see that mixed. But for me, I think what really makes this good and what I enjoy the most, I think it's like our little band of misfits or whatever kind of thing, our, our storm tracers and, you know, especially Philip Seymour Hoffman's kind of, you know, out there character and stuff. The suck zone. It's the point, basically, at which the twister sucks you up. I mean, that's not that technical term for it, obviously, but... I think that's really what makes this movie enjoyable for me. Yep, yep, no doubt. The characters make this movie enjoyable. Like, it, it's such a simple premise, and then you have all these very simple introduced characters, and you're like, all right, Rabbit does maps. You don't need to know anything else about Rabbit. Rabbit does maps, you know? You don't really need to know, like, all of the individual things that each of the people on the team does, but they feel like a family. They do feel like a team throughout this movie who has been together for years, you know? They they all play off one each other very naturally. It's a lot of fun to watch that kind of, you know, camaraderie in, in a, a major motion picture and and not have to, you know, have me in particular complain about, oh, you know, that person's not fleshed out enough. Like, I don't care. You know, the people who need to be fleshed out, you know, Bill Paxton, Helen Hunt's character, Jerry Gertz's character, that's fine. Those Those all work out. Everyone else here is just it's just here to make it feel like one big happy family and and it definitely hits that tone. Oh yeah, I totally agree. And man, poor Carrie, man. I, I really do like hating his character in this movie too. <laughs> He's which such is a, perfect. He plays such it a so scumbag. Well. Yeah, such a dirtbag, yes, exactly. Oh, I get it. You wanna take credit for my design, is You're that a liar. It? Uh, man, he 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 does it. You're right. You're so right. He does it so well. You you love to hate him. And a lot of things that this movie, too, I think is pretty well known for it, at least at the time, was like the special effects and like the audio. I think those are good, especially like looking at the time, like the 90s. I think like special effects were awesome in this. Now, watch it a little bit. Some of the scenes, I kind of look a little bit like, you know, maybe like the, the water spouts and stuff. But at the same time, too, I'm thinking like, well, how else would you do this? Like for what they did and everything, I think it looks really good. And then, of course, one of the big scenes that everyone likes to talk about is the rolling house that the car like drives into and you know actually like practical effect kind of thing like really cool on screen but i, I have to be honest with you like watch it now i'm kind of like oh my goodness you gotta be kidding me <laughs> <laughs> well yeah you know it, it was it's almost like right there with the dante's peak and and volcano where it's just happening in this small little area of oklahoma really this like rush of storms that could you know be more than you know a record-breaking outbreak or whatever of, of tornadoes you're just like, oh, you know, you got to be kidding me. That Like, the chances of this happening is just ridiculous. But, you know, I, I agree. From, from some perspective, the effects are really bad now, especially, like, the satellite effect at the very beginning. Oh, my um, goodness, Randall. I'm glad you mentioned that one. When I first saw that, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. And then when it, like, zooms out and shows that they're kind of looking at, like, a map, too, I'm like, okay, I hope that was just, like, a computer simulation and not meant to be a real look at a satellite. <laughs> that was awful. It literally is a computer simulation. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but, you know, I think for the most part, given the time and the budget constraints of this film, and you, you remember that, like, in comparison to, like, Independence Day, which came out the same year, which it lost the Academy Award for effects to, the, the, the Twister stuff, it it ages pretty well from, like, special effects perspective. It's it's not terrible. Like, um, But I, I, I do also want to pick up on something else you said. It's kind of related to the effects, but it's the audio. I love the audio in this film. So, like, the score doesn't really do much for me, but I absolutely dig... Like the tornadoes when they eat something, you get that like growl up. It's it's not realistic, I'm sure, but I've heard some people say some similar things and and ideas about how twisters, you know, tornadoes kind of sound like they they are eating things. Um, like the roar is just crazy. So there there is that, but really the thing that sets me off the best is like the string melody, the really? And you know, you get that with the shining going on in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Come play with us, Danny. <laughs> 
So the the effects I think have aged pretty well for the most part. The main like disaster effects and the audio for the tornadoes really does work for me. Yeah, I actually when deciding, yeah, this is me talking like tech a little bit, like where I wanted to like watch this this movie. I actually picked like the home like uh setup that has like the better surround audio as opposed to the better TV screen because I'm like, "Eh, it's a movie from 96." And yes, I think the audio is excellent. And I'm like, you know what, I'm going to whatever TV has the best, you know, audio surround or whatever. That's how I'm going to watch this movie. Because I think that really does enhance this movie and stuff, too, to watch that. So if you're thinking about that in your own thing, like, yeah, this the audio definitely shines in this film. Hey, side note, did you notice that uh, in, in the drive through where they're showing The Shining, there's a small sign that says it's a double feature and the, the film after The Shining is Psycho? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yep, right after the shiny, what I want to watch is Psycho. <laughs> you know, I love that Loki like we were having those like scary movies or whatever playing during it and kind of adds to, you know, the feel and stuff of this film. I think it was well done, well played or whatever. I don't know that it would play very well for watching like some like Disney, you know, cartoon or whatever <laughs> when it comes in. It probably would have had a much different effect or impact on the movie. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I just thought that that was a fun, like, it's a fun little tidbit, like, kind of trivia. Well, what was the second film from the double feature in Twister? Huh? <laughs> Psycho. One thing, uh, too, I like about this movie, I think the pacing is really nice on it. This movie is, like, real, you know, fast-paced. Like, we have, like, the next door and the next door, and there's always, like, some kind of action go. And we do have moments where we, you know, breathe a bit and learn about the characters, whether, you know, they're arguing inside the car or, you know, they're talking to the aunt or whatnot. And I think there's just a good enough balance. This movie, to me, never feels like too long. I think it moves along pretty well. And it's, you know, I don't think it overstays its welcome either. It's not like a too long of a film to watch. Yeah, th- this film takes place over like two and a half days. And it's crazy how much can happen, but like when these storm systems move like they do, it's like hit when the you know the griddle's hot. Basically, you have to you have to always be moving. Next storm, next storm, next storm. So that that's kind of a thing that could totally happen in real life for for real storm chasers, where you're just like, all right, we're following this storm now. Another one's coming. Now another one's coming. We have to get here. We have to get here. That's that's pretty cool. Now. Our channel doesn't necessarily always dive into like some of the behind the scenes stuff or the making of films, but I was looking at some of the stuff in regards to Twister because I was kind of more interested in I'm like, oh my God. Any channel that does behind the scenes, like making of films, this thing is full of it because I noticed, particularly, I've always noticed this, the last storm, the very last F5 tornado that's giant is filmed in like the nicest possible day ever. It's like a blue sky everywhere except for the tornado, you know? <laughs> like, no, they're formed out of, like, storm cells. They don't just show up in the middle of bright, sunny, blue sky days. And there's, like, a whole filming reason for it, basically. The weather, this entire film, the weather and the sky would just never cooperate with what needed to be done. So I'm like, man, they're so they're just sitting there waiting, like, you know, James Cameron waiting for that perfect sunset when he wanted to film it for Titanic. It's like, yeah, nowadays we would just CGI it, but back then it was too expensive. One thing I want to talk about, kind of like story element, I don't know if this is kind of annoys me a little bit more or not. It's, it's fine. Like, I enjoy this movie. This is a nitpick thing, but I've noticed it in a lot of other movies, how we have, like, our characters with almost, like, special abilities and stuff. Like, Bill Paxton's character in this, he, he like, he, like, knows what the storms are thinking kind of thing. So you're telling me that Billy knows what a storm is thinking? Something like that. Gum? And, you know, it's whatever. It's okay for the movie. But I just noticed that in a lot of other movies. I don't know if it's getting a little old or not, or just something that I didn't really notice before. Like, we were doing, like, Dante's Peak a little bit. It was almost like, you know, as I joke, you know, James Bond is the one person that's like, I don't care, you know, what everything else says or whatever. This thing is going to erupt kind of thing. That's kind of the vibe I got through the movie of, you know, our characters having this extra sense kind of thing. Do they need to? I don't know. Like I said, this is nitpicking. I mean, it's still fun. It makes for a fun character and then you don't have to go too much into explaining his background. I guess from some perspective, but like 
he never really questions the science or anything or, or all of the tools or the team or you know he he's on board with them it's just that he has a good sense like a good feel for for how these things work basically is all is all i've ever felt from it's like he's not a superhero or extrasensory he just he just like you know he looks at the clouds he sees the way the wind's going he he has a good feel for how things are and some people have very good direction and other people get lost in a mall you know <laughs> it's just it's just it's just that you know like it and i didn't i never found that too too distracting what i always found distracting from a character perspective is his new fiance which is jamie gertz's character like tagging along and then oh she's here you left her with dusty how could you possibly do that and like she just keeps getting drugged from like one like spot to another and then she has that that line where it's like you know when you used to tell me that you chase tornadoes deep down i was just that was a metaphor well what do you think i used to do when i said i was a storm chaser extreme <laughs> randall extreme <laughs> like she's extremely gullible but you know she's she's that everyday character that that other people can kind of latch on to that you know that's not a storm chaser doesn't understand all of this so when she says hey now you've lost me again i don't know what you mean when you say f3 or f4 you know so that way her character is the gateway in for people who have no idea what's going on or haven't seen the movie a bajillion times like you and i <laughs> Yeah, it's it's good character, you know, to show that and also to, like, you know, show more of, like, you know, Bill and Helen Hunt's character, too, how they are so much different. And it's almost like, you know, Bill Paxton was trying to, like, get away from that adrenaline junkie life and try to, you know, like, settle down and have a life that's completely different. And I think that's what she represents in this movie for him. And then, you know, he realizes, you know, he still has that itch for that, you know close to death encounters and stuff yeah he definitely still has the itch <laughs> for science randall for science for science but you know uh there is one thing that has always bugged me besides the blue sky in, in the end scene you make this device this revolutionary device which is going to go into a tornado that's cool the whole idea is cool you know but the delivery system is is like is just junk because you have to get it to a spot and you have to like flip like five or six switches and turn this knob to like get it turned on like it's crazy you, you need to get in and out fast you need to design that thing to like turn on with a switch you know like get it on the ground turn off the switch drive away not just like this long drawn out how to enable all of the systems on this thing no 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 turn it on with a switch figure that out please Rando, I thought you were going to complain about them using Pepsi cans instead of Coke cans. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Pepsi might have uh, sponsored this? Or, or is Pepsi the only pop you can get in all of Wakita? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> but to our viewers, we're not sponsored by Coke or Pepsi. So. <laughs> no, no. But if Pepsi or Coke wants to sponsor us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's 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 still a fun film to watch. I I found myself really enjoying it, and and because I've seen it so much, I'm sitting there with my wife, and I'm like just saying lines before they happen, and she's like, "You're weird," and I'm like, "I have seen this movie a lot." <laughs> cow, I gotta go, Julia. We got cows. <laughs> Another cow. Actually, I think that was the same one. I can basically quote it. Yes, this is definitely a good movie, at least from my opinion, too. And, you know, Randall, that's one of those things that we hit on all the time, too. If it's a quotable movie, we know generally like it shows that we like this movie. And yes, I think it, it still holds up. I still enjoy it. And, and I'm actually shocked by the audience review scores. Well, you guys are part of the audience, too. We want to know what you guys think about the movie Twister. Let us know in the comments below. Also, be sure to check out some of our other videos while you're there. We have other flashback reviews, new movie reviews. We look at TV shows, and we also have deeper dive discussions. We also have a Facebook page where we always post the day before what we're going to be posting on YouTube the next day. We also post videos every Monday and Thursday. Be sure to come back and check those out. For now, I'm Randall here in Texas. I'll see everyone next time. And I'm Matt here in Michigan. Have a good day, everyone. Next time 
on No Market Media. Please consider checking out some of our other videos.